I've shared with you before how there are biblical passages that now in my life land differently because I live in the desert southwest, an area much more like the setting for the biblical stories. And so it was with this familiar passage to me, and it was around verse 12, where Jesus, who's, who's wanting to explain, and we'll get more into this later, that God isn't interested in hurting us or punishing us, that God wants to bring goodness. And Jesus says, because if a kid asked you for an egg, would you give them a scorpion? Now before, scorpions, I understood they were real, but they were like, you know, weird little lobsters. They were the thing of storybooks and movies. And then I moved here. And there was one in my house. Which one is this? Ooh, Bark Scorpion. Looked it up. Google is sometimes not your friend. They get in through holes the size of a credit card slit. They can crawl up your walls, into your bed sheets, live in your shoes. They're the most poisonous scorpion of all, and they're everywhere. Ugh. And now, when I think about budgeting for life, I had not originally in my budget for life had a monthly fee that I pay for someone to come spray around my house, so I hopefully never run into one of those. And I understand they tend not to kill you, but I don't want to have that painful sting that can also leave your leg partially paralyzed for a while. No thank you. So I was thinking about this where Jesus is talking about this and the feeling level of that, right? I mean, imagine if you had, say, went to a McDonald's and you ordered an Egg McMuffin. And you get it, and you unwrap it from that yellow paper, and you notice it's not as thick as usual. Where's the egg? And you open up the two English muffin halves, and inside are wriggling bark scorpions. Ew. Who would do that? No one loving or sane. And so Jesus is wanting us to understand that, that there are times, though, that people have this idea of God that, well, if God got a hold of me, if I really pay attention to God, God somehow just wants to torment me or make me miserable or, or doesn't understand what's good or best. And I think about, there was a story someone told years ago in a Bible study of her childhood experience growing up in a Baptist church in Idaho. And in that church, every summer, the missionaries would return that they had sponsored, and they would share their stories. And these were, by the way, in this church, missionaries who were converting people to Christianity somewhere. And so they would come back, and they'd share their harrowing tales and their joys and the miracles and all this sort of thing. Except she didn't remember what they talked about. What she remembered as a little girl, that the platform they stood on was at eye level for her, and she saw their shoes. And she said they were the ugliest brown shoes she'd ever seen in her life on every single missionary. And so she grew up with this picture, if God gets a hold of me, I'm going to have to wear ugly brown shoes. And I don't want anything to do with that. The late Reverend Bruce Van Blair describes this theology as God as cosmic idiot. That there can be this understanding experience that we don't trust that God would really want what's good for us or for others. And that can come from our experience and relationship with other people, right? Because other people don't always want what's best for us. And also, there's loads of bad theology out there. So I think about, for me, a current experience and the, the sort of cultural and Christian reaction to it, which is after each mass shooting, there's usually, it's the politicians first who will say, our thoughts and prayers are with the victims, right? Intoned in those sorts of feelings. And then there's people like, yes, we must pray that there be an end to this. And then often the very next day, there's another one. And it could seem like, you know what? We're asking for eggs and we're getting scorpions. Yes? And so some have concluded, well, let's stop asking. Let's stop praying. What's the point? But another way to consider this is the people talking about thoughts and prayers, as I've said before, often aren't really praying or thinking. Also, sometimes we don't really know how to pray. What's that look like? What is prayer for? What's it about? Because Jesus, whom we say we're following, he prays all the time. Jesus, he's praying in the morning. He's praying in the midday. He prays at night. He's sometimes praying all night long. 
Jesus prays on the road. He prays in the wilderness. He prays in the synagogue. He prays in the temple. Jesus is prayerful. And sometimes there's that, that saying that some of you recognize where people say, well, what would Jesus do? We actually look at his life and ministry. Well, the first thing is he'd pray. He prays to seek and listen for what God is calling him to and to connect with the power to live it. And it seems that his disciples have noticed this. They, they see the ways that he talks with such wisdom. There's healing. There's justice. There's this fullness of life all flowing through Jesus. And they see that he prays a lot. And so for the disciples, there's this, well, well I'll have what he's having. Right? They want to be in on it. And so one of the times, there he is praying. Seems like a good time to ask, hey, Jesus, please teach us how to pray. Now, before we get into what he says, let's stop for a moment. Because if we pause, we might wonder, don't they already know? I mean, they've grown up. They're, some of them might be young men, but they're, they're adults. And they live in a really religious culture. I mean, they grew up. There's no separation of church and state. There's, I mean, it's everywhere. So there's set times of prayer, and there's feast days, and fast days, and rituals, and commandments. And, right, and it wasn't sort of like, oh, if you feel like it, you go to worship. Everyone did. It was just what you did. And so we could ask, well, don't they already know? And in that, there's a reminder, there's always more to know. We can always go deeper. I think about in my own life and experience, I grew up in the church, a United Church of Christ congregation, and we were not dabblers. My family, we were there every Sunday. I was in Sunday school, and then confirmation, and then youth group. I was even the youth representative on our youth ministries committee in my church. I was a delegate to the national youth event of the United Church of Christ. Eventually, I discerned a call to ministry and went to seminary, got a Master of Divinity degree, was approved for and ordained in the United Church of Christ, and almost throughout all of it, hardly anyone taught me anything about prayer. I'd heard some people pray. There are a few things here and there, but when you look at how central it is to the life and ministry of Jesus and think I could experience all of that and not receive much help or instruction or guidance about prayer, well, it might raise questions about, well, maybe that might be one of the reasons the mainline church is struggling. Because I don't think there's lots of people who get it about prayer and then hold it as a secret. I think often people haven't received much help or instruction or guidance themselves. But I got some. There were mentors and colleagues, and I went on retreats, and I began to learn more about prayer. So even though that first part of that story sounds like bad news, the good news is, no matter who we are or where we are in life's journey, we can always learn more about prayer and listening and being part of this way of Jesus. We don't have to feel like we should have already had it all together by now. So back to Jesus' response to his disciples when they asked, teach us to pray— no surprise, Jesus teaches by doing. All right, here, I'm going to pray. Here's what I'm going to do. And as you heard, Jesus starts with addressing God and says, Father. Now, let me be clear. Jesus, in teaching prayer instruction, is not addressing the question. The burning question of his era was not, what is the gender of the divine? This is not what people were wondering about or asking about. So when he uses that language, it's not that Jesus is teaching us that God is a dude. That's not what he's doing. But there were questions about, does God actually care? Is God connected with us? Is, God, is there intimacy or is God kind of far away and distant? And so Jesus uses a word that's about relationship and intimacy. And most likely the word Jesus used in his own language Aramaic, because we see it other places, is Abba. And Abba doesn't mean fa I'm father. I don't know if you, I didn't call my dad father. Father sounds sort of formal, right? It's like, I don't know, maybe leave it to beaver. Yes, father. But then daddy is a different word. And the word Jesus uses is the daddy kind of word. Also, there is this, and I, I've talked about this sometimes in some Bible studies, so some of you heard this before, but I find it really interesting that in that word Abba, I'm going to do a quick Hebrew tutorial. Are you ready? But it's a simple word, right? Uh, in English, A-B-B-A. -B -B -A. In Hebrew, the letters are Aleph, Bet, Bet, Aleph. 
Bet is B-E-T-H, by the way, that's, but it's pronounced Bet. Aleph, Bet, Bet, Aleph. And each of the letters in Hebrew, also some of them are words or have meanings. So the, the, the idea is this word also is, a, we might say, a word picture. It creates a visual for a Hebrew speaker. Aleph means the expansiveness, the all that is. The word bet means house. Aleph, the expanse, bet, house. So in this Aleph, bet, bet, Aleph, you have this picture of the expanse that all that is, is then housed, made flesh. That which is made flesh can give way to the expanse and all that is. It's a metaphor for breath, right? I'm breathing in from this expanse, and it becomes housed in me, and then I breathe out and offer it back. That's sort of a metaphor for life. So that is also wrapped up in the word that Jesus uses to address God. It's this idea of breath of life, I want to breathe you in. I want that embodied in me. And then there's this language, it, it gets translated different ways, hallowed be your name, or holy is your name. When you hear holy, you probably, I don't know about you, but I just think like it's a religious word, right? We tend not to use it for other things. But in its own context, it just means something set apart for a purpose. So we didn't use this language in my household growing up, but we had, in this sense, holy dishes. My mother had some dishware that was from her grandmother's house that we had set apart for special times, for purpose, for other times of the year. We didn't use it every day. And in a way, it was kind of enlivening us or awakening us to the celebration, the festivity. And so there was something about using it for that purpose. It was, a, a, we might say, served awakening. And so when Jesus says, hallowed or holy is your name, there's this idea of it serves awakening. And the name also, and I know I'm giving lots of Hebrew thought things here, but the name in Hebrew in that culture isn't just a word. It's not like it's magic. Your name is your whole way of being. It's your whole way of living. It's your identity. So to say holy is the name of God is to say I'm setting apart the whole way, the being, the identity of God. It's a way to say I want to live awake to that. I want to live into that. It's not like, God, your name is magic. It's, God, I want to live awake to your whole way of life. And then Jesus, in the center, like if you look at the language, the center of the prayer is the heart of the matter for Jesus. That he says, your kingdom come, thy kingdom come, kingdom come, kingdom come. Now, I know for many of us, we, if we heard that phrase, we used it to say something impossibly far away. Like, I'm going to knock you to kingdom come. Anyone ever heard that? Right? But that's not how Jesus uses it. Kingdom come, the reign of God's justice, mercy, love, it's at hand. And Jesus says the heart of prayer, the heart of all prayer, doesn't mean we can't also pray other things, but the center of the heart of prayer is saying, God, I want to be in on what you're doing. God, I want your love, your justice, your mercy to reign in me and through me. So notice it's not asking for a pony. You still could, but still, in the, it's in the context of asking that I embody the reign, the spirit, the life of God. And then Jesus is not, some people have this idea of the spiritual life is just this ethereal, not paying attention to the things of the world. But notice in the heart of the matter, the core prayer that Jesus teaches, he knows we have to eat. We are bodily beings. We have physical needs. He also knows we're not going to live much kingdom come, the reign of God at hand, if we don't know where our next meal is coming from or we're just anxious about the material things. So he's in baking into this idea of prayer is saying, God, help me to trust that I will receive or get to or connect with the things I physically need. So I'm not anxiously worrying about those things. And it's not God, Jesus saying, you know, God's going to drop food into our open mouths from the sky. It's this idea of in community, in connection with God, we can be led to receiving what we need, trusting that God wants to help us receive what's necessary for life. And then there is this language of there are things we need to receive and let go of to live into the heart of prayer. That there are ways that we have messed up. We've hurt ourselves. We've hurt other people. We've hurt the environment. We've hurt creation. And so sometimes, whether we're conscious of that or not, we live with guilt and shame. And if we're full of guilt and shame, it's really hard to embody the reign of God and to bring healing and hope into the world. So Jesus also says, so pray, ask that you know you're forgiven. Ask that you can be set free of that guilt and shame because God's forgiving you. And when you're leaning into that forgiveness, you're empowered to set other people free 
you can then have what's needed to forgive others. Because again, can't really live kingdom come if we're holding on to resentments and hating people. So then, so we've got this prayer, and you can hear it has a lot of the same basics that's in what we call the Lord's Prayer that comes from Matthew, though there's some things missing. And that's also an important piece. It's not magic words. It's not an incantation. Jesus is just giving the thoughts and rhythms and patterns of prayer. And then he says, but here's the most important part. Keep at it. Be persistent in prayer. That prayer that's just dabbling in, prayer that's every now and then, is not very relational. I mean, if you think about it, right? The people that you're most connected with and trust the most are the people that you're connected with, that you, you, you know and have a sense of who they are. But if you never interact with them or spend time with them, it's hard to trust. So Jesus is then with these stories saying, keep at it. And he tells a story that might have been even a bit humorous in its own time. I mean, imagine right now in your own home, it's midnight. Well, unless you're a, a, a late night person. Whenever is the middle of the night for you, and then whether it's your phone ringing or the doorbell, but someone's outside your house, a neighbor, you know them, and saying, I have surprise guests. Their flight came in late. I realize I don't have anything to feed them. Can I borrow something from you? Hmm. And some of us might be inclined to say, what are you bugging me for? But let's say they just kept, you know, ding dong, ding dong. Finally, like, what? Right? But we do it, even if we're grumpy about it. And so in the time of Jesus, the, 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 the housing situation is different than for most of us. It's a family bed world. And it's multiple generations. They're likely all in one space, mats on the floor. And you, you went through this process where you first put the little ones down. And then once they're okay and settled, then the next ones and the next one. So it's this long process to get everyone in bed. Finally, there's that sense of the breathing, right? And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Oh, are you kidding me? Can you please give us some bread? And Jesus is saying, you're going to be resistant to that, right? I mean, it's very disruptive. But if they keep knocking, you're going to help. And Jesus is saying, so even you who might be grumpy about it still help people who are persistent. How much more, Jesus says, does God want to help? Does God want to engage? Does God want to be at work? But notice what Jesus says. The language he uses is about how God is at work. The prayer that God is best able to answer is the prayer of giving us the Holy Spirit. Not a pony, not winning the lottery, not fixing other people for us, but Jesus says what God wants to do is breathe in the very breath of God, empower us, transform us, heal us, and equip us so that we can bring what is powerful and healing and transformative into the world. That this is what prayer is meant to do. It's not, as I've said before, using Rob Bell's language of uh, petitioning a reluctant God to do what God should already be doing. Prayer is starting with God who's closer than our next breath, seeking to be part of God's goodness in the world by God's power and strength at work in us, in us together, that brings healing and transformation and help and hope. And I don't know about you, but I spent a lot of time in the church and never learned to pray that way. But this is the way that Jesus prays. This is the way that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. And it's transformative and healing and hopeful and once I began to learn how to pray in some of those ways, it brought transformation and healing and hope into my own life. It's the work of God, but prayer was an incredibly important and still is tool to be able to embody the justice, the hope, the healing, the reign of God. Kingdom come, prayer is an incredible tool for that to happen. So I had, last week I was in Seattle. It was much cooler there. That's not really a point of the sermon, but I just I had to say it. And uh, I served a church 20 to 28 years ago in Seattle. And um, I know all kinds of people who are still in that area. And when I go to Seattle, there's certain people that I'm close friends with and I just will automatically see or spend time with. And then there's the people who, like, they hear I'm in town or coming, and like, do you have time to get together? And some I can, some I can't. But one of the people who reached out to me and said, do you have time for a coffee? I thought, hmm, I'm talking about her in my sermon when I get back. It's the brown shoe woman. She said, do you have time for coffee? Yes. 
And she's delightful, and we sat down, and as she always does, she has amazing questions and doubts and authenticity and earnestly seeks to embody something of God's goodness in the world. And it was a rich and rewarding and life-giving conversation for me because I had not had a conversation with her in 20 years. And as we're wrapping up the conversation, I said, hey, can I see your shoes? She stretched them out under the table. They were silver with little sparkles catching the light. God is good. God wants us to be part of God's goodness, to bring what is bright and sparkly, healing, hopeful, and just into the world. So let us keep learning like those disciples. No matter who we are, where we are on the journey, we can always go deeper. We can always be open more widely and bring more of God's life and love into the world. Amen.